Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. You're about to listen to a historical episode of Dark Poutine. After episode 149, you will find Scott is no longer with the show. In an effort to maintain continuity and offer listeners as many episodes as possible, we are leaving the episodes in which he co-hosted intact. Thank you. Scott sick. I got the six. <laughs> Welcome to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, creator and host. With me as usual is my good friend and co-host, Scott Hemingway. Say hello, Scott. Well, hello, everybody. I hope you're feeling better than I am. That voice is mighty deep there this week, Scott. My sick voice is sexy as hell. Is that yeah? Is that what you call it? That's what I call it. Okay. Yeah. That's what, yeah. So, so typically when I like to leave uh, audio messages on my phone, like, like if it's like, hey, you reached Scott. I'm not around right now. That's the best time to Yeah, do. yeah. Yeah, I just sound like a toad. A ribbit. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Listener discretion is strongly advised. We're not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We're two ordinary Canadians chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. Sick chump. Sick chump. Canada horns from uh, Vancouver. Gotta love that. I do. I absolutely do there. Yeah. Uh, a part of who we are here. And speaking of Florida. <laughs> I don't think we did, but okay. We're going to Crime Con uh, from May 1st to 3rd, 2020. That's just so crazy. It's in Orlando this year. Uh, 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 Orlando. Uh, Home uh, of uh, Disney uh, World. Orlando. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they moved it there. And if you want to get tickets for crime con to come see scott and i and a lot of other cool true crime podcasts and other awesome true crime related things do we have a code mike we do it's poutine 2020 or poutine 2020 <laughs> as we will hear later on yeah. and you'll get 10 percent off your tickets that's a, that's a great do it best to do it now before christmas because i apparently the price goes up after christmas so well get on it now so you'll save double you'll get 10 percent off from us and the tickets will just be cheaper get her done so do it do it because we want to meet you all yes each and every one each and every one of our listeners we want that to happen that would be an amazing lineup (laughs) (laughs) so this is episode 104 Mm -hmm. 104 We're, we're there yes we are we're there Uh, If this episode doesn't leave you feeling disappointed and angry, especially in the Canadian justice system, and as well, you're going to be loathing the perpetrator by the end. If those things don't happen, I'm not sure you're alive inside. So this is going to be an uplifting story. Oh, you're going to love it, Scott. Great. Uh, That said, you may have a much better grasp on the logic behind some of the decisions made in the later stages of this frustrating case, but... uh, Okay. Yeah. All right, well... A further word of warning about this case before we start. It does involve the deaths of two children and their mother. And these children are both under 10 years old. Oh, this guy can already burn an L. So we're off to Hamilton, Ontario in 1976 for the Rollo family murders. Doesn't ring a bell. The bulk of the research for this case comes from court documents, the writings of Canadian true crime journalist Max Haynes, and some news coverage, especially helpful was the extensive coverage from the Hamilton Spectator as written by award-winning columnist Susan Claremont. Her riveting and detailed three-part series on the case called Secrets, the John Rallo story, was super helpful. So we'll post 
links in the show notes so you can check these things out for yourselves. Yeah, sweet. On the morning of August 18th, 1976, the Labonte boys, Sean, 13, and Paul, 11, were fishing with their mother at Jordan Harbor, just west of St. Catharines, Ontario. Leaving their mom behind, they were playing along the shore when they noticed something unusual floating in the water nearby. It was a large blue vinyl duffel bag. Curious, the boys pulled the duffel bag to land and opened it. A green garbage bag was inside with something wrapped in it. They pulled the garbage bag open and it took a moment before they realized what they were looking at. It was the body of a little girl, no more than five years old. The two ran off hollering for their mother and police were called. That That is not anything you need to see at that age. That is scarring, traumatic. At any age. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right now, if I'm I'm 50 years old, if I saw that today, I would probably be very, very upset. Holy shit, yeah. Yeah. While the crime scene was being secured at Jordan Harbor in the area of that gruesome discovery, and the little girl's body was being taken to the morgue at St. Catherine's General Hospital, a call came in to the Hamilton Police Chief, Gord Torrance, and it was from local businessman Doug Paulington. He and his wife, Margaret wanted to report that their 29-year-old daughter Sandra and her two children, Jason 6 and Stephanie 5, had gone missing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see where this is going. Their son-in-law, John George Rollo, had showed up that morning to tell Doug that Sandra had run off with another man, taking the kids with her. John, looking disheveled and more nervous than his usual cocky self, claimed he'd slept in the den in the basement of their home and woke up at 9 a.m. on August 17th, finding that his family was gone. The only thing Sandra had taken with her, other than the two children he claimed, was her wallet. John presented Doug with a typewritten note he stated was left behind by Sandra. Yeah, how convenient it's typewritten. Right. The letter read, quote, I'm writing this letter to say goodbye and ask you to try and understand what I am doing, John. I've met someone who I love very much. He's a rich lawyer from out west who I met while working last year. He can give us everything we want. End quote. That doesn't sound like... That sounds like what I would write in a note if I wanted somebody to think this was from my partner. Okay, fair enough. Here. John begged Doug to talk to a lawyer rather than police. Sandra, John, and the kids had been at the Paulingtons' home swimming the day before the trio disappeared. Uh. Sandra seemed happy and the kids were playful, but John seemed sullen. Sandra had given no indication that she was about to leave. Something like this was not in her character. She was close with her parents, trusting them with everything. She would not have just run off without talking to them about it, especially if she planned on taking the kids. Yeah. Rich guy, though. Rich lawyer, though. I mean, come on. The lawyer that Doug had been talking to convinced him to call the police. Rallo himself had spoken to a lawyer already, Dennis Roy, on the evening of Sandra's disappearance. Rallo asked Roy how he would go about finding his family, and Roy suggested a private investigator named Ronald Arnold, who Rallo later retained. According to court documents, Rallo explained to Dennis Roy that, quote, upon finding the note, he became enraged, tore up the rug in the master bedroom, and took it to the dump. He also told Roy that he had ripped up the rug because it was soiled and smelled, and his wife had complained about this. Roy noticed that Rallo's left hand and wrist were injured, and Rallo told him that he had fallen off his bicycle while riding it on the evening of August 17, 1976. A whole lot of coincidences right there. Well, no, I, know I this, mean, he's explaining it. I, 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 this is the first thing I would do if I found out my family left. I'm going to tear the carpet up. Yeah, and just so you're aware, somebody uh, saw the light on in his home at around 5 a.m. that oh. morning and, oh. and witnessed him moving up and down as though tearing up a carpet. Yeah. So, well, I mean, you, you got to get up at 5 a.m. to do that. Rage kind of doesn't know time, Mike. Yeah, especially when you say you were asleep nine till 9. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Well, it's a sleep rage. <laughs> 
the body of the little girl was examined at the morgue to determine her identity and what had happened to her. According to Susan Claremont's three-part column, Secrets, the John Rallo story, the girl was naked, three feet seven inches tall, she had bruises on her temples, invisible tan lines from a two-piece bathing suit, and a band-aid on her right knee. <sighs> from court documents. The post-mortem examination of the girl disclosed that death was caused by asphyxia. Dr. Ferris was of the opinion that asphyxia was produced by suffocation due to the application of firm pressure to the face, end quote. After a day off sick, John Rallo came to work at 9 a.m. on August 19th, informing his secretary that his wife had run off with another man, taking the kids with her. The police arrived later that morning. According to Susan Claremont's secrets, John Rallo said, I was just going to call you. <sighs> just going to call them. Oh, my God. I, I, I'm i just stuck on that poor little girl. Yeah. I, I can't I can't move past that poor little girl. And, oh, God, I just want to choke this guy already. As investigators were talking to Rallo, Hamilton police learned of the body of the little girl found outside St. Catherine's. By 2 p.m. that afternoon, using a family photograph that had been provided to them by the Paulingtons, Hamilton police tentatively identified the body as that of Stephanie Rallo. Yeah. This was later confirmed by the Paulington family, who visually identified the little girl. So, Doug, her grandfather, had to go to the morgue himself oh my God. and look at his granddaughter. There, like, I just, I, I can't. I can't. Like, five years old. It's just, all it is is innocence. 100%. That's all you're, you're looking at is innocence. Yeah. Just beauty and innocence and snuffed out. Unaware that his daughter's body had been found, John was asked to go to the police station for an interview that afternoon. He drove himself, and according to Susan Claremont's articles, on the way, he stopped off at the bank to switch a joint bank account he'd shared with Sandra to sole ownership in his name. What? Well, I mean, if she'd taken off, he wants to make sure all the money's his, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. As, well, this is the 70s. It's not like money was easily accessible. E-transfer it to... Yeah. In the interview, John claimed that he'd been receiving anonymous phone calls from a male caller, a lawyer, for the past year when Sandra was not at home. He claimed the man knew a lot about the family. John stated that he'd spoken to Sandra about the calls and that she denied any knowledge of the caller. But John hadn't told the police about the calls. Neither had Sandra. Man, like, so how do you just... Do people call people, Hi, I'm Scott, I'm a lawyer. And I'm, Is I'm Michael having, there? And I'm having an affair with your wife. Is Mike there? Let me... Are you sure she's not there? Because I have a lot of these details I know about her. Like, Strange details. Yeah, because typically it goes like, hey, is Mike there? And then he's not around right now. No problem. Can I take a message now? It's okay. Bye. Not, hi, I'm Scott and I'm a lawyer and I'm looking for Mike. John was later told that his daughter was dead. And although he hung his head, he didn't shed a tear. <sighs> John George Rallo. Hamilton City Hall office manager and secretary of the city's traffic and engineering committee was arrested and charged with the murder of his daughter, Stephanie Rallo. Oh, good. As he was denying any involvement, police went to work securing the Rallo family home and John Rallo's Ford Maverick to gather evidence. I like that they're not effing around, like they're straight to arrest. Yeah. A police photo taken of the frowning, unshaven 33-year-old John Rallo on the day of his arrest is telling. In the full body shot, he's wearing a rumpled mint green leisure suit with dark buttons and wide lapels, you know, befitting the time, yeah. over a white shirt and a light green plaid pattern. He's wearing odd black shoes with a white instep. They look like spats, kind of. Yeah, yeah. His wild, curly hair casts a shadow on the white wall behind him. Behind massive, round glasses are angry, piercing dark eyes that don't quite look into the camera. His hands hang awkwardly at his sides. He was just informed that his five-year-old daughter is dead. This doesn't look like what you would expect to see from... Uh, facially, anyways. It, it no. looks more, more like, oh, fuck, they caught me. He looks enraged. Yeah. 
Yeah. Like enraged that he has to go through this. Yeah. Yeah. But that suit. It's terrible. It's terribly great. I mean, if it was better fitted, it would look fantastic, but it's not better fitted. No, it just looks, you know, I mean, we can make fun of 70s style all we want. I'm all making fun of the guy. But, uh, but yeah, he just looks creepy. Oh, yeah, no. The second you showed me this photo, I was like, ugh. I have to post this picture in our show notes on our website because this guy is just so spooky looking. Yeah, with like the second you showed it to me, I'm like, oh, this is clearly like a murderer. How have I not seen this photo? It looks like it would be... Yeah. Yeah, making the rounds of murder. Shown in other police photos taken on the night of Rallo's arrest were the cuts, scrapes, and bruises on his hands and fingers. Mm. John claimed it, you know, that he'd been riding his bicycle around in the darkness after Sander and the children had left to blow off some steam. Yeah, you rip up the carpet, go for a bike ride. These are the things you do. Normal things. Yeah, in the dark. He said he'd hit, quote, a rut or stone or brick or something and fell from his bike, injuring his hands in the process. But you would expect abrasions. These just look like cuts. Well, there are, yeah, some... Are there? Yeah, you, it, it's just black and white photos. Uh, you can't see it very well. But this guy has an answer for everything. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Police dragged the waterway in the area that Stephanie's body had been found looking for Sandra Rallo and the couple's six-year-old son, John Jason. They did not find either of the remaining Rallo family at the time, but they did find the badly decomposed body of a Hamilton man who'd been missing since April. Oh, uh... Mm. Just fluked out. Yeah, that's uh, unexpected. Yeah, and they quickly told reporters that the two deaths were unconnected and that the man's demise was presumed accidental. Mm -hmm. Oh, was he a lawyer? (sighs) No, Uh. uh, completely unrelated. The searches of the Rallo home at 16 Latana Court in Hamilton and John's car provided some interesting clues. Mm -hmm. As well as the bare floor in the Rallo master bedroom, where the shag rug had been, even the under padding was gone. Hmm. There were small blood stains, about seven of them, hmm. on the drapes in the bedroom, and that was later matched to the blood type of Sandra Rallo. Hmm. Yeah. No DNA Ty- at the time. Type was all you had. The couple's bed had been taken apart. The box spring and mattress were in the upstairs hallway outside the bedroom. Rallo's answer for this was that he couldn't bear to sleep in the bed he'd shared with his wife, who he'd just discovered had been cheating on him. Oh my God. And there were blood stains on the box spring as well. You know, I've had my heart broken in the past, Mike. And, like, usually my next week is just me crying in a corner. Not ripping up carpets. No, or... ripping up carpets, going for late night bike rides, Taking throwing away apart. mattresses. And yeah, going like, to the dump. No. I, if anything, I'm lying on that mattress smelling like, oh, this is where we used to right, exactly. Like, yeah. We... This man is acting bizarrely. Very An expert later testified that, quote, the stains on the drapes and the box spring were consistent with blood being splashed on them with some force Mm -hmm. rather than being dropped on them. That sounds right. There were blood stains found on the bare concrete of the basement floor. Investigators determined this must be where Rallo had brought the bodies to wrap them up and dispose of Mm. them. There were also blood droplets leading to and in the garage near where Rallo's maverick would have been where he'd most likely loaded the bodies of his family into the trunk of his car after murdering them. Yeah, that yeah, makes sense. There was blood found on the carpet fitting the bare spot in the basement floor, which had been rolled up and placed nearby. There were other bits of blood evidence, too, throughout the house, telling of brutal murders and, thankfully for detectives, a really crappy cleanup job. Mm, yeah, good. The garbage bag that Stephanie had been wrapped in was matched by a manufacturer and proven to have come from an open box of bags in the basement of the Rallo home. Kind of thing always fascinates me. It's what you would see in forensic files. Mm-hmm. But, you know, like just be, you know, being able to match. Yeah. Yeah, it is really but fascinating. M- whenever you watch that on a show, you, you it totally makes sense. You're like, oh, okay, I, I get like the striations and the... Yep. Yeah, they only fold the bag one yeah. way and depending on the... Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. pretty fascinating. It really is. Cops also went to work searching the dump where Rallo had admitted to being on the day after the murders. A security officer there remembered Rallo at the dump that day. He had two boxes and three garbage bags to dispose of. Hmm. Carpet matching that found in the basement was found at the Glanford dump where the security guard was, but 
Shag carpet stained with blood matching the Rallo bedroom was found at a second dump on Ottawa Street. Mm -hmm. John Rallo had answers explaining away this evidence, too. Well, of course, he just seems to be a man of answers. From court documents, he said that he gave the pieces of rug and under padding to a, quote, garbage picker at the dump. He denied that he had gone to the Ottawa Street dump, of course, because there was some damning evidence there. Mm -hmm. He said that the blood stains in the master bedroom were from a nosebleed suffered by Sandra while playing with Jason. But again, it was splashed, not dropped. dropped. Yeah. The smear of blood found in the garage came from a cut that Sandra received to her foot. The portion of the mattress cover that was missing was cut out by Sandra after Stephanie had vomited on it when they lived on Durden Street before moving to Latana Court. You were kidding. He really had answers for everything. Everything that they asked him. Yeah. This was like, I just think like, everybody in this house, according to him, is just walking around. Uh, Bleeding and Walking up. open wounds everywhere. Yeah. As the search continued for Sandra and Jason, Stephanie was buried in the local cemetery on August 24th, 1976. The Polingtons had to bury their granddaughter, with thoughts of their daughter and grandson's disappearance weighing heavy on their minds. That John, their son-in-law, was charged with Stephanie's murder had to be confusing, too. Mm -hmm. How could a father take his child's life, and what had he done to the other two family members, mm -hmm. if it was him at all? And how could they have been so blind to a possible monster in their midst? John Rallo had even been involved in a multi-million dollar property development deal with Doug Pollington. Mm. It just didn't make any sense. On Thursday, August 26, 1976, another gruesome discovery was made. Oh, no. As OPP officers were combing the waterways via helicopter, they noticed another item that was out of place, floating in the water of the Welland Canal. From Susan Claremont's article, Secrets, quote, at 12.27 p.m., an officer notes the discovery. A green cloth zippered sleeping bag, the bag was tied with what appeared to be rope and sash cord, and the bag was open at one end, with part of a green plastic garbage bag sticking out the open end. I observed a pair of feet with the toenails painted red. Oh. The rope and sash cord are elaborately tied, each knot related to the next knot. There are two sleeping bags, a blue inner one and a green outer one with a label sewn into its lining that says, Jason Rollo. <laughs> Sandra's body is decomposed. Her green eyes are discolored. There is a round hole above her right ear. Mm. Bruising to her thighs, forearms and face, the tip of her nose is crushed. There is a red mark on her chest. Her tongue protrudes between her teeth, typical of strangulation. End oh, quote. man. Brutal. Man, oh man, oh man. I debated whether or not I was going to put that much detail in, but it was in the newspaper, so I thought, okay, we can, we'll put that in there. Well, it sounds like the, there, so he beat her, but also... Yes. Uh, Strangled her. Yeah, with, you know, with the bruising on her chest or red mark on her chest like yeah. maybe he was straddling her and oh man doug pollington had to id the body of his 29 year old daughter as well oh my god john rallo was charged with a second count of murder two of three found it was determined that sandra had in fact died from asphyxia the pathologist the same one we mentioned above noted that sandra had been badly beaten shortly before she died and may have been unconscious due to the severity of the blows before she was strangled. Oh my God. Sandra Rallo was buried on August 31st next to her daughter Stephanie, who'd been enrolled at Peter Pan Nursery School at the time of her death. Oh Jesus Christ. In October of 1976, police officials called off the search for Jason Rallo, a t-ball player who would now be seven years old. Body or not, John George Rallo was charged with a third count of murder. Jason's body remains missing 44 years later. Oh no, really? Yep. Oh. He's never been found. But there was a horrific mix-up in 1977 where the body of another boy found near Barry uh -huh. was misidentified as Jason Rallo. They oh. even buried him beside Stephanie and Sandra, but investigators on another case had the body exhumed, and sure enough, it wasn't Jason, it was this other boy. Oh no. 
Oh, that's harsh. Isn't that awful? Yeah. So the family undergoes three funerals, and then one of them turns out to be a completely false one. Yeah. Not that you, you know. And Rollo's reaction, apparently, to the finding of what was presumed to be Jason yeah. was weird. Mm, and he really? Didn't, he didn't seem overly concerned about it. Probably he knew it wasn't him. Yeah. Well, but I, you know, I would, like, he, he definitely would have dumped him in a body of water. I mean, he's two of them. That sounds like what his... M.O., yeah. yeah. Anyway, we'll take a breather right here. And we're back. So how are you doing with this one, Scott? Oh, um, I'm great. No, I want to, I'm... I think you want to cuddle with Mr. John, um, John Rallo. Uh, pardon my friends, I'm fucking livid. Like this, this, these are the ones that just, uh, I, I can't have empathy. Yeah. Uh, often I'll be able to find something that I can empathize with the killer on. Uh, I, I just want... Well, we haven't proven that he's the killer yet. We just happened to use his three names and... Uh... I saw the suit. Yeah. I saw the suit. That man's <laughs> that guilty. That suit indicates guilt. Sweet, sweet suit indicates guilt like nothing. Oh, boy. Uh, so be prepared to feel even more frustration here. Well, thanks for the heads up, Mike. You're welcome. In a court appearance, it was ordered that John George Rallo was to undergo a psychiatric evaluation. After nearly 60 days of testing, Rallo was determined to be fit to stand trial for the murder of his family. Mm -hmm. On December 24th, John Rallo was able to leave custody on a $100,000 bail. Wait a minute. That's right. A triple murderer was able to go home to his parents' place for the holidays. Y Merry Christmas, everyone. Holy sweet Jesus. I guess they gave him bail because the people who were in danger are already dead. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't process this. Uh, that happened. I, I mean. He was out of jail awaiting uh, trial for almost a year. You know, they can, they can do a thing called like no bail. You, you, you got to stay in the pokey. Well, he got bail. Holy he almost had a really shit. good lawyer. Holy shit. Rallo's trial was set for November, almost a year later. And that's right. So he would be out, out and about in Hamilton before Holy he actually had to face the music for what many believed he was responsible for. Like you could just be at the coffee shop yep. chat, chatting with this guy in front of you. Yeah. You know, just waiting for a coffee and just like, eh, hey, well, how's your day? Oh, it's cold out. Nope. And killed his kids and wife. Yep. Murderer. According to Susan Claremont's article, Secrets, John took advantage of his freedom. Quote. Every day he puts flowers on the grave shared by his wife and daughter, the one with the space left for Jason. He goes to Latana Court, mows the grass around his children's swing, and walks through the house. He waves at the neighbors, but they do not speak to him. End quote. What a son of a bitch. Can you imagine being the neighbors? You know what's happened there. Yeah. You know what's happened. You know what he's accused of. Yeah. And sure, he hasn't been tried yet, but this troll... Is yeah. walking around, yeah. mowing the lawn, yeah. waving at you. Yeah. When you just want to flip them the go, bird. Go, uh, the thing that run gets, at them with a shovel. The thing that gets me is going to the cemetery and putting flowers. And I was like, no, you put them in the cemetery. You put them in the cemetery. Yeah. You, but, you, well, he maybe he's trying not to look guilty, Scott. No, oh, come, clearly he's trying to not look guilty. But I think it's that just, actually it, makes him look just, more yeah, guilty. It just doubles it down. It's bizarre. It's like he was, I believe, he was taking actions that he thought. How an innocent person is supposed to behave. But it was totally not no. how an innocent person would behave. No. An innocent person would be, like, mortified. Yeah. My lawn would be so unkempt. It probably would be anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's why I don't have one. Well, guess what? Oh, God, what? He also wanted to go back to work at City Hall. He also wanted to go back to work at City Hall, but uh, they didn't want him there. Well, good on you, City Hall. Surprise, surprise. Well, good on you, City Hall. You know what? Why don't we just going to wait till your case is done? See if maybe you're a murderer? Yeah, let's, you can just be yeah. on leave until we find that out. Let's wait until we know if you're not a murderer or you are yeah. a murderer. They have, they dropped the charges? No, no. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine? So you're the supervisor there, Scott. Yeah. yeah. You're the you're the manager yeah. who's, who's dealing with this situation. Yeah. And uh, okay, I'll be murderer man. Okay. All right. Sure. Charles. Sure, hey. This. Um. While I'm out on bail, can I come back to work? Oh. 
Uh, you're out on bail or like has the, have the charges been dropped? No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm charged with three counts of murder. And, and, and you feel, you feel like now's when you want to come back to work? Well, I need to do something with my time. You're coping okay? You're uh, being too nice. No, no, I'm getting there. I'm, no, I'm getting there. It's taking too long. I'm getting, so just out of curiosity. Sure. If maybe I like, I have to memo you or something. Yeah. Am I going to end up dead? Well, that remains to be seen. Okay, so why don't we wait till the trial's done? <laughs> Aww. And we know that you're a murderer or not. Okay, well, that sounds fair. Yeah. John George Rallo was born in Hamilton on November 30th, 1942, to Jack, an OPP forensic ident officer. Holy crap. And his wife, Dorothea. His dad went to work for the liquor board later as an inspector. Oh. Growing up, John was a mama's boy always overdressing and carrying himself with an air of cockiness. He was obsessed with girls. Okay. After finishing high school by correspondence, he took communications and management at a local college. Hmm. When he was 20, he met 15-year-old Sandra Pollington and uh, was immediately smitten, much to her parents' dislike. Oh, that's not a good start. They didn't like him because he was much older. Yeah. And Sandra. Yeah. Uh, then Sandra, and he was Catholic. Well, you know, I could let that part go. Yeah, the religion thing was a big deal in days on gone by. Sure, I'm yeah, more focused on the 20 to 15. That that ratio is pretty... It's, it's, it's a big... It's five years is a big number when you're 15 years old. Yes. Yeah, it was like 40 and 45, like, oh, whatever. Yeah. But uh, 15 mm -hmm. and 20, no. Sandra's love of John won her parents over, and in 1966, she and John married. John was now working at Hamilton City Hall in the engineering department and doing well. Hmm. John Jason was born on August on October 30th, 1969, and Stephanie was born on June 30th, 1971. Hmm. So these two kids would be as old, same age as me and my sister now. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I'm close behind them. Yeah. yeah. So although John Rallo now had two children and a wife that adored him at home, it wasn't enough. Of course. John always seemed to have another pretty woman in his life. He was not faithful to Sandra. Although not all John's extramarital relationships crossed into the line of sexual infidelity, he was definitely emotionally adulterous and often distant with Sandra. This caused friction in their marriage. Like it will. John did have a sexual affair with a married woman in another department at City Hall, and it ended a year before Sandra, Jason, and Stephanie were murdered. <sighs> On November 23rd, 1977, John Rallo's triple murder trial began. It lasted 16 days, which is pretty short as yeah, far as murder yeah. trials go nowadays. According to Susan Claremont's article, Secrets, the Crown called 48 witnesses and introduced almost 150 pieces of evidence supporting the charges. Claremont also mentions that a week into the trial, Due to public outrage after the testimony about John's sexual trysts with another woman, his bail was revoked. Oh, well, a bit late. Yeah. <laughs> the jury was unaware of this turn of events as it may have proved prejudicial, sure. so it was done yeah. out of their view. Yeah. The Crown's evidence showed that John and Sandra had fought violently for one reason or another, most likely over his multiple affairs on the night that Sandra was murdered. John had strangled Sandra with a cord from the drapes. The children had seen their father's rage and were murdered to get rid of them as witnesses and probably to truly afford John the freedom he ultimately desired. You know what? He wouldn't have had to do that if he didn't murder his goddamn wife. There is that. Over two days on the stand, testifying in his own defense, John stuck to his story that Sandra had taken the kids and run off with this mysterious lawyer who'd been calling their house for over a year. So he, he, he took the stand, eh? Yeah. Yeah. He testified, coldly lying and explaining away the bits of evidence that he could. John claimed he was worried the night after the family had disappeared, sleeping on the couch in the living room. From Susan Claremont's Secrets, quote, I stayed there all night, looking out the window and dozing off, waking up hoping if a car came into the court or a cab or something and it was Sandra, I could see her out the window, end quote. Hmm. Yeah, well, that's not going to happen. You murdered them. That's right. 
Evidence that the jury did not hear regarded the stack of magazines full of graphic and violent bondage pornography found in the house by police before John was accused of killing his family, before they went missing. Like a year and a bit before. Holy crap. John had groped his sister-in-law, Janice. She was consoling him for something. Mm. It didn't really go into it why. Yeah, yeah. The magazines were found by investigators when they were investigating these charges of sexual assault. Wow. Yeah. Of note, some of the knots used to tie women in the magazines also matched those found in the rope and cords that were used to bind Sandra mm -hmm. when she'd been found murdered. Mm -hmm. The court felt that releasing this to the jury would again prejudice them against John Rallo and prove fodder for future appeals. Uh, so yeah. I, I see airing on the, that yeah, side makes yeah. sense to me. It, it seems like it would be relevant info, but yeah, it, it is unrelated. It's completely unrelated, yeah. except for the knots. Behaviorally, it fits, but uh, yeah. Yeah. On December 14th, 1977... After six hours of deliberation, the jury came back with their verdicts. John George Rallo was found guilty on all three murder charges. Thank goodness they had not bought the line of baloney that he was trying to sell them. Oh, thank God. John was given a moment to speak before sentencing. Oh, no. He took the opportunity not to apologize or take responsibility for the crimes. Why would he? But he wanted to express what hardships he'd been through. Um, there's going to be some swearing by me after this. From Susan Claremont's Secrets, quote, Well, my lord, in your charge to the jury, you said the past 16 months has been hell for me. What has kept my head above water is that I know I did not do it. But more importantly, I know Sandra knows I did not do it. Stephanie knows I did not do it. And Jason, wherever he may be, knows I did not do it. End quote. Sweet fucking crackers. What a load of shit. John was sentenced to life imprisonment without the eligibility for parole for 25 years for each of his victims. Oh, phew. And those sentences were to be served concurrently. He spent his first Christmas in isolation in Kingston Pen away from the other inmates who wanted him dead. I like those other inmates for that. He soon settled into prison life, though. Uh. True to form, in 1979, while in prison... John met a woman and struck up a relationship with her, still denying any involvement in the deaths of his family. I'm so sick of prisoners meeting women. <laughs> yeah. Well, John kept the relationship a secret from prison officials and the Parole Board of Canada. Oh. This woman would be listed as a, quote, family friend on her visits to see John in Kingston. Oh, okay. From Secrets by Susan Claremont. By 1992, the couple has had four private visits, spending 72 hours at a time in a trailer on prison grounds. In 1997, John proposes. Neither John nor parole officers inform the National Parole Board he is in a relationship. It isn't until there is a passing reference to John's girlfriend in a psychological report that the board learns the truth. Mm. Mm. Isn't that crazy? It's very crazy. So these two were in a relationship for 26 years of his incarceration. Holy shit. They broke up in 2005. But it just seemed like, it, I can't see why they'd break up. <laughs> like, this just got to be a lovely relationship. Well, you know, dating a guy in prison? Yeah. That well, sounds great. At least you know where he is. It's exactly. You don't have to worry about it. He's probably not going to be cheating. Well. Pro I said Probably. I said, probably, Mike. I left some yeah. wiggle room Fair there. enough, fair enough. Of course, as soon as John was eligible for parole in 2000, he began applying every two years. Of course. He was already receiving escorted temporary absences from the medium security prison since 1993. The Paulingtons, of course, opposed these moves, but they were happening regardless. From Susan Claremont's Secrets, quote, he cooks his own meals, takes long walks, joins Toastmasters, and is on a work crew doing manual labor in the community. He attends church in Gravenhurst. He visits Hamilton regularly. End quote. Oh, Jesus. You've killed three people. Your family. Two of them are children. But you're going to church. I mean, you know, things well, then, are looking... Then he's everything going to, balances out. He's going to Toastmasters. Yeah, it's He's not, probably it's able to do his own podcast. Yeah, 
Yeah, his public speaking's probably improved Excellent. dramatically. Yeah. yeah. So he can lie more eloquently. Yeah, I mean, that's that's all great. His bid for parole was turned down, as was his bid for unescorted temporary absences in 2000. Mm-hmm. The parole board stated that in the 24 years that he'd been in prison, there was no appreciable change indicating that he would not reoffend if released. A psychiatrist said he was emotionally flat and lacked remorse. Yeah, you know, yeah, clearly. Yeah. So he was turned down again for unescorted temporary absences uh, and day parole and full parole in 2002, 2004, and 2006. Well, that's great. In 2007, though, after finally crying, this time with tears, in a hearing, he was given unescorted temporary absences from the prison. So this cock only has to cry one time. One time. And they're like, oh, we, okay, we got you. Mr. and Mrs. Pollington weren't there because they were too ill at the time to attend. Oh, my God. Yeah. From Susan Claremont's Secrets. Quote, On August 26, 2008, John gets out after nearly 32 years in prison. The triple murderer is granted day parole. He has not confessed. He has not revealed what he did with Jason. And now he is free. End quote. I'm... I'm... Well, he spent 32 years there, Scott. He was granted day parole, so he's. They're not. She's not saying he's released from prison. Day parole. Day parole. So like, yeah, for a day. Yeah. Well, he's he's got full parole now, Scott. That came soon after. Oh, fuck. Really? Yep. Really? Yes. Not not once has he said, "Okay, I here's did where, it," and here's where Jason is. I, not once. And they let him out. Yep. I don't care how reformed you, you are at that point. You aren't reformed unless you've admitted that, to it. Which I get the catch-22. If you're innocent, then you know, you'll, you'll he's, never he's get He's jumping out. through all those hoops except for no body, no admission. Which, how do you let, like, how do we let people out? We're seeing it happen again in, uh, in the case of uh, Brock Graham. That guy's doing work work release right now. Yeah. Cheryl Duggan told me all about it. He's on work release. Really? Yep. You kidding? He's working toward getting out of jail. Yeah. He's killed two people. He's definitely a serial killer. Oh my God. My brain is going to explode. Right. Uh. So John Rallo moved to Sudbury. As after his mother's death, it was decided he had no reason to return to Hamilton where he was unwelcome. <laughs> yeah, you know? Yeah, that'll happen. His presence would be pretty painful for some people, I would think. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. John's other parole conditions stated that he must continue to report any relationships with women to his parole officer. Because we know he can be trusted, 20 you know, years of dating in prison and right. not mentioning it. And he must acquire psychological counseling regularly. So there you go. That's That's... Sounds great. That's all we need. In September of 2019, it was reported that John Rallo and George Lovey were living in the same halfway house in Sudbury. Both of them are murderers from Hamilton that are unwelcome back in their home city. The inappropriately named Lovey murdered his ex-girlfriend's parents after raping and attempting to kill her. What the shit? I wonder what kind of dinner conversation happens at that halfway house over their mac and cheese. Yeah, pretty, I'm sure kind of like, you know, high five, a lot of high fives. Like, we did it. We got out. We did it, man. Yeah, we did our time. We got out. We're free. So here's the thing. Okay. Is doing time enough? Oh, it's, I think in 95% of the time, yes, it is, depending yeah. on, on the crime, depending on the situation. What about contrition, though? Uh, that, is it, it, was time enough for, for hitting this? No. No. This is not a person who should ever get, get out of prison. What, so why do you think he's out? What, what's, what's your thoughts on this? Oh, God, it's so difficult to determine without reading the parole board's findings and hearings. And um, I'm just, all I can think of is trying to make, make room in the prisons. Uh, sure. He's yeah. just jumped through all the hoops. Yeah. Like there's, but, but, the, but the key... there's no law in the books that says you have to tell, you have to say, this is what I did. You, there's no 
I, I think they and, call it an allocution yeah, in the states. And, and nor should there be, because again, if you're legitimately innocent of something, mm-hmm. like you know, you're not going to want to admit to it. You're not right. going to admit to it. Nor should you. And so I get that. That I get. I that. don't believe he's innocent, though. Yeah, he was never set free on any appeal. No, I, I just, I, no, I, I, I don't. I know feel... it's a tough, it's a tough one because say you know Adnan, you know, if he admits that he did it, mm-hmm. he'd probably get out. Yeah, but he's not going to because yeah. he's innocent. Yeah. I don't know. Like, maybe yeah. John Rallo thinks that's. I don't know. I don't. I really don't. Well, know what's in going my on mind, in this guy's brain. In, in, you know, uh, somebody like him. He's had a lot of time to yeah. contemplate and think about this. I'm sure he's now bought his own lies. Sure. Uh, sure. Fair know, enough. Yeah. Uh, at least while he's in, in prison, he's he's bought his own lies and he feels strong about them. I don't know. I think these guys, if if. I mean, it brought Graham even admitted to doing what he's done. Yeah. But he's still looking at parole, even though he's not admitted 100% to where Lynn Duggan's body is. Yeah. So no body, no parole. Yeah. Especially in a case like that. This case, he's not ever admitted anything. Yeah. So. And, and I think a big, a big difference in, uh, is time enough or not is... Are we talking multiple killings? Yeah. Because if you've murdered multiple people, I don't think that you should be brought back in the public because it just is pretty clear indication you have a problem with murdering people. You have a problem it, with it, murdering your family. It's not just a, like, um, I I was it, a moment of, of, I was drunk and I got into a fight at the bar and I hit a guy and he hit his head on the table and like... It, and not that those are like, well, that's okay, but it's, it's not, no, you, you, with Brock Graham, you know, two separate times he murdered a person. But this guy. Yeah. This guy, <coughs> he murdered his wife and then, and then took the time and went and murdered his kids. So he has not a problem with murder. No. He has not a problem with murder. Therefore, guess what? Prison for you, Dillweed. Exactly. But that's not the way our justice system works. So I guess it's, uh, that's it for this week's story and it's time to lighten things up a little. Yeah, please. (laughs) Jesus. So we have a new phone number. Yeah. And it's toll free for our North American listeners. It's 1-877-327-5786. What's that number? 1-877-327-5786 or 1-877-DARK. P T N. Oh, I get it. Dark 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 Putin. Yeah. Yeah. So A R K P T N. Yeah. So if you want to, give us a call. A few people have already taken opportunities because I mentioned it in the Yumber Yard and it's on our website. So if you forget or you can't find this number, you can go find it on the contact page on our website. And we sorted through some of the better voicemails that we got there we oh, got great. we got a few it's please it's not a complaint line either people i don't know i haven't listened to any of them well this fun. first one is a bit of a complaint well, that, okay all right yeah and it was really interesting the only issue is that it's in french well i'm fucked exactly so here it is apparently it's quite racy so <gasps> if you're french you might uh be shocked by what you're about to hear uh let's just take a listen and uh and i'll explain in a bit i'm interested Ouais. Ici Régent Pétro, Damas, en Abitibi, Témiscamingue. J'appelle parce que j'ai des affaires qui me tombent sur les nerfs à propos de ce podcast. Ça fait 100 épisodes que j'écoute, puis ça fait 100 épisodes que Mike et Scott sont pas capables de dire Poutine. C'est Poutine. Pas Poutine ou Poutine. Poutine. Notre plat national. Puis ils sont même pas capables de dire. Ça se peut-tu? Corlis de Tabarnak, de Corlis de Sti, de saint sibois de Simonac. En plus, t'as Mike qui dit qu'il n'est même pas du journaliste, mais on le sait tout ce qu'il pense. Puis c'est clair aussi que Mike fait tout le travail, puis Scott qui nous chie sa tête avec ses commentaires niaiseux. Ben c'est quoi cette affaire-là? Il se pense les ding et dong du monde de podcasting? En tout cas, j'espère que ça va s'améliorer. Continuez votre beau travail, les gars. Wow. Uh, okay, so I, get, I picked up a lot of that. There was a few things, yeah. correct? You know, uh, yeah. 
a, a lot of there was quite a bit of actual French Canadians profanity in there, which is uh, yeah. You know, sorry, I, I uh, Quebecois. I heard my name and it didn't. The, the tone of his voice after didn't sound super jazz. No, it wasn't. So I reached out to a former employee of mine okay. who actually took the French calls at that old telecom that uh, we used to work at. Is it Guy? No, it, his name is Kevin. Kevin McCormick. No, it was not Guy. <laughs> That's a long story. <laughs> inside joke. Inside joke for anybody who worked there. So Kevin translated the call for us word for word. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. So I uh, can't wait to hear this high praise we're going to get. So it goes, yeah, this is Reagan Terrio. Or this is Reagan Tetro from Amos in the region of Abitibi, Timiskaming. It sounds like it's Russia. <laughs> well, it's somewhere in Quebec. Right. I'm calling because there are things about this podcast that's getting on my nerves. So great. I've listened to 100 episodes and it's been 100 episodes that Mike and Scott uh, haven't said Putin correctly. Putin. It's Putin, not Putin or Putin. 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 This is our national dish, and they can't even say it right. How can this be? Then there's that string of French-Canadian profanity. Yeah, I heard... Uh, Calis and Tabernac. I heard Tabernac, yeah. yeah. And also Mike says he's not a journalist, but we all know he thinks he is. It's clear that Mike does all the work, and Scott, who shits in our heads with his stupid, silly comments. <laughs> They're not inaccurate. <laughs> what is this thing? They think they are ding and dong. <laughs> Uh, they're a comedy duo from Quebec oh. of the podcasting world. Oh, okay. okay. I don't know who Ding and Dong are. Well, they sound successful. Anyway, I hope it will get better. Continue your beautiful work, uh, in parentheses, sarcastically. Whoa. Eat a cart full of crap. <laughs> and while you're at it, go shit in your toque. Oh, man. This is, uh, Reagan is, uh, this sounds pretty bitter. Yeah. But yet he still listened to 100 episodes. Well, thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's like... Merci, he's, monsieur. He's, he's, a, he's a sadist. He, he, he was just, a cooting. Yeah. Uh, uh, what? Listening. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. L'autobus. He's <laughs> <laughs> my French. Oh, you're terrible. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so thank you to Reagan for uh, for listening to us for 100 episodes. Yeah, I, I guess... finally taking the time to... To let us know we've been pronouncing Putin. I really, I, I don't think we should change a damn thing because like if Putin. he's if he's made it this far, if he's a hundred in, if yeah. we change, he might stop. Hey Reagan, thanks Putin. for listening to Dark Putin. Yeah, and um, you're always Putin in our books. Yeah, there you go. But we did have another person call in, and this one was weird too. Oh great, this person thought. I think that we're an actual poutinery. Oh, oh, okay. So here's, oh, here's, here's his, his call. We could give it a whirl. Hello. I would like to order two orders of dark poutine and a diet Coke, please. Thanks, Will. <laughs> so, yeah. So he wants to order two. Orders of dark poutine and a diet coke. That's great. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Yeah, um, we're uh, not a poutinery. We're really sorry, uh, but I guess he didn't understand that. Yeah, and, and he called back again. Oh, I was I was gonna say he's gonna be waiting. No, he called a second time. Okay, all right. Well, that's well, that's good. Let's listen to what he had to yeah. say. Hello, I called earlier about two orders of dark poutine. They've not arrived yet. So, so yeah. Oh, sweet sassy molassy. So we're really sorry, uh, sir, whoever you were. He sounds very familiar to me. I did sound, there was some familiarity. So there. I know that voice and I think that there may be a dog named Steve involved. <gasps> just saying, oh. just saying. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Oh boy That's... is right. We did up. get some compliments too. Oh, we did. Yeah, here's one from the East Coast. Well, they've got to be trolling. I saw a 902 phone number, so it it had to be somebody from Nova Scotia. Hey, Dark Poutine, the best podcast ever. Um, favorite Canadian podcast. I love Mike and Scott. I love how you folks deal with every podcast and how you approach sensitive topics. Um, never anything negative to say about you folks. You always tread carefully and. You're fabulous. Love, much love from the East Coast. And I look forward to many more episodes. 
And that was it. That was super sweet. Yeah, wasn't that nice? That was super sweet. I wish we got your name so we could say thank you yeah, directly. Yeah, she didn't leave her name, but... That's uh, okay. That's okay. Let's give out her phone number. No, I'm kidding. No, it's, we didn't. Have to <laughs> that, do that. that was super nice of you. But And we got one more. Oh. And this is from Haley from Kelowna. And she had a question. A question. She had a question for us, which is, and it's actually a really good idea. So oh, let's okay. have a listen. All right. Hello, boys. Um, I hope you're having a wonderful day. I basically just had a question to ask. Um, first of all, I'll say you're awesome and amazing, and we all love you. But I think you probably know that already. Um, I was just curious if you guys have ever aired listener tales of a sort, um, whether they be general spooky shit or encounters with ghostly figures or whatnot. Um, I listen to Morbid quite frequently as well, and the girls do listener tales, and I'd actually submitted a story into them. Um, they have about 800 stories, so I haven't heard it yet. Totally understandable. <laughs> However, I was just curious if you guys offered something like that as well, because I think it would be really cool to hear personal stories from other people, whether it be connection to serial killers or just their own personal weird and spooky experiences. So I hope you have a wonderful rest of your afternoon, evening, morning, day, whatever time you happen to be listening to this at. Um, this is Haley from Kelowna, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye. Well, that was just all kinds of wonderful. Yeah, so thanks, Haley. Uh, yeah. Carol and I got to meet Haley at our meetup in oh, Kelowna. Cool. Yeah, she's a pretty cool person. That's really awesome. Yeah, and I think that's a really good idea. I mean, so, we did a Halloween episode where we had other podcasters. Yeah. So I've been kind of bashing around some ideas about implementation for mm -hmm. just such a thing. Mm -hmm. And we'll reveal more early in the new year oh, about this. So nice. I think it is something that we might want to pursue That's and uh, maybe have a bonus episode or two about this kind of thing. I think I dig it. I dig it. Yeah. Right on. Thanks, Haley. Yeah. I think that is a great idea. You're the bee's knees. The bee's knees even. Yeah. Which it just doesn't make any sense. Though, <laughs> what? Do bees actually have knees, Scott? I don't think they do. Well, I yeah, always wondered maybe that. Maybe they do. I don't know. Like, if a bee has knees. But even so, like, what's so great about them? Yeah, why are bee's knees great? Yeah, because that's what the expression means. Like, that is so great. Oh, that's the bee's knees. Like, that is the top of the top of the pops. Well, you know what I think it is? Hmm. Bee's Knees is just so, something that's fun to say. Yeah, if only there was some resource that we could type <laughs> things into that would help us. Like the amazing magical internet that I'm not going to bother with because this is pointless and other people can do it for us and maybe talk yeah, to us about what a, the bees need. It's easier to have other people do it. Hey, you know what? Call us at one 327 5786 and talk to us about what you think the bee's knees is about. Dark poutine. Dark PT. Dark PTN, yeah. yeah. All right, let's get to it. It's time to uh, say thank you to some patrons. Oh, the good times. Uh, Emma Walsh from Calgary, Alberta. Emma, Emma Walsh, the, okay. Yeah. That name sounds very familiar. I think we might have said it last week, but we just said it again. Yeah. Well, double, double thank you, potentially double thank yous. Lori Edmondson. Yep. And she is from? St. Louis. St. Louis, Missouri? Up, upper St. Louis. Oh. Yeah. Which isn't what you think. You would think that's the kind of means like north, but it's not. If you live a, a certain, if you live in an apartment oh, above a certain amount of floor, yeah. Oh. So like if you're above the thirty sixth floor, Fantastic. that's considered Upper St. Louis. Okay. And, and so yeah, that's where she lives. She lives there. Great. Yeah, and and she is by trade. A window cleaner. A window cleaner. Yeah. So she never really even has to live in in the same building. That is that she lives in. So she doesn't even have to leave to go to work. She just goes up a couple more tops. And then, you know, when she's down at the lower floor, she's like, eh, she likes to joke about, like, eh, I'm from the lower St. Louis now. <laughs> and she'll go up, and, oh, I'm back in the upper St. Louis. None of that makes any sense. I think it makes a lot of sense to me. It does? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Fantastic. All, all kinds of sense. What does so. she do? She, she's a window cleaner. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Upper St. Louis. Upper. But St. then when Louis. she goes down the lower floors, yeah, I like it. St. Louis. <laughs> You're not well. She gets kick out of that. 
Next up is Veronica Sinor from Beaufort, South Carolina. Beaufort? Yeah. This sounds like a name in South Carolina for sure. Beaufort. That's weird. Where are you from? I'm from Beaufort. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm I'm from Beaufort, Eh? South Carolina. Would you like some butter on that? Yes. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) The answer is yes. Oh, you remember at the airport? Hey, babies, you want some more coffee? Hey, babies. Hey, babies, you want to see? (laughs) That lady was so nice. (laughs) the best. I like how they made us wait until the breakfast order. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was quite like, oh, yeah, what's, what's going, going on? What's Why going are they on? making us wait? They're ignoring us. 1201. <laughs> hey, babies, you want a table? <laughs> yes, I would love a table. Hey, hey babies. Hey, babies. <laughs> the terrible people. Every single thing. Heidi Temple from Knoxville, Tennessee. Oh, oh that's I like a... how I said Knoxville and not Knoxville. I do, yeah. It's like, like, like I'm from there. I was going to say, it's like you're, you're a, a national. I'm you're a Knoxvillian. From... Yeah. Hey, anybody want to come to Knoxville? I'm from Nashville or Knoxville. Yeah. Tennessee. Tennessee. Oh, thank you, Heidi. Thank Temple. you so much, Heidi Temple. Yeah. Oh, cool name. Lee Alexander from Bath, Maine. Oh, Wow. Okay, Lee. Thank you. Bath. I love Maine so yeah. much. Uh, do you think most people shower in mm. in Bath, or do you think they ba- bathe in Bath? They bathe in Bath. Like, is it is it a requirement if you live there? It's like, no, you gotta you don't shower here. Like, all property only has ba- a bit baths. Baths. Okay. <laughs> and next we have Sean Dissington. Yeah. And I don't know where Sean's from. Oh, Sean Dizzy, Dizzington? Yeah. I'm just trying to make sure that I've got the right Dissington, show. Dissington, yeah. Dissington. Oh, yeah. Dissington. Yeah, that's different than, than who okay. I was thinking. Okay, yeah. Yeah, from, um, from uh, Moscow. Moscow, um, Russia. USSR? Oh, yeah, yeah. US, it's not USSR. It's Russia now. It, Sorry, it, yeah, Russians. Yeah, he said, Would you like some borscht? That's what he often says. Oh. Even though, even though he knows, like it's just so stereotypical. So, what does Sean Dissington do in Rush in Moscow, Russia? Oh, uh, um, I'm trying to remember. See, he doesn't like it talked about because you know communism. Okay. Yeah, no, and, and we know they're fair not, enough. They're not, they're not communist anymore. No. But, but you still get well. But what he does is he puts boots on cars, like actual boots. Yeah. Not like the boot to make it not go. No, that's what you would think. That's what most people think. They're like, so if you Russian paid cars have boots on them rather than tires. It's a symbol. Oh, yeah, it's a symbol of working man. It's 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 to symbolize like this person goes out every day, oh, and busts their butt. Yeah. To feed their family, and so the boot is kind of if, if he recognizes you're a hardworking man, he puts the boot on your car, and then everybody's like, "Oh, we've got a hardworking man over here. This is great. Oh, woman, well, we have a hardworking person over here." Oh boy, yeah, it's clear. I mean, yeah, it's it's a good, it's a it's a good. He's doing uh, he's doing God's work. Well, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, if you believe in God, he's doing that. That sounds uh, interesting. He's doing all out work or whoever's. Okay. I mean, he's doing the work. So we did get some donut money sent to us. Oh, we did? Yeah. So here's one from, interesting. <coughs> here's one from Diana Kashabi. Okay. I, I'm really hoping that I pronounce that name correctly. Kashabi. Oh, wrong. I did. She says it here that that's how it's pronounced. You've, well, never, you've never been wrong. I'm often wrong. So she said, when Joe Fulgham, the host of the wonderful but sadly finished Caustic Soda podcast, recommended your show on Twitter a while ago, I immediately subscribed. Oh. After a month of listening to you guys basically every day, I'm now all caught up on Dark Putin. Oh, wow. And looking forward to new episodes. See how I'm pronouncing it correctly? Yeah, yeah. Putin. I'm <laughs> Putin. I'm sending you some donut money to thank you for all the chills, laughs, and for approaching every single case you cover with much empathy. Greetings from Innsbruck, Austria. Oh, wow. Diana Kashabi. If that makes sense. Yes, pronounce Kashabi if that makes sense. So what wasn't that the caustic soda done here? Yes. Yeah, so he keep, uh, the guy he was talking to us at the meet, or at, a, at, at our the, live show. Yeah, he was there at the yeah. live show. Yeah, yeah. Nice fellow. He was a nice, really nice guy. I had no idea who he was, but he was a really nice guy. Wow. I remember, like, after Wow, Scott. After I talked with him, I'm like, oh, okay, sure. But I didn't know the show. I don't know a lot of things. Well, here's one from Tracy Don Dupont. Okay. 
She sent donut money from Yellowknife. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait. Here's one from... Okay, no. Here's one from Tracy Don DuPont. Sending donut money simply to tell Scott to shit in his hat. No. Oh. As a current resident of Whitehorse, yeah. who's been to Yellowknife, yeah, yeah very different. Yeah, it depends. And, is, and trapping is al- actually alive and well in the Yukon Northwest Territories in Nunavut. Just today, Northern Stores announced they will no longer be buying pelts from trappers due to unprecedented market conditions. There you have it. Still my favorite podcast. Oh, yeah, I still stand by my statement. <laughs> You probably shouldn't. But thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it was so nice of her. It was really nice of her, but you see what happens when I screw things up? We get money. We do get money. So, I mean, I'm not sorry. You're not sorry I'm that not you sorry. screwed up? Yeah. Well, ching that's, that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. Uh, Bethany Staub ah. sent us some donut money, and she says, Thanks for being awesome. Please have some coffee and donuts on me. We will certainly do that. Monet Terrio sent her <laughs> monthly contribution. Wow. Yeah. Thank you so much. Got Cin- the money, money. Cindy Andrews, thank you, Mike and Scott, for a fantastic podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. For the awesome listening. Emma Woodlock. She sent some uh, donut money without a note. Oh, that's still okay. We still love you anyway. I'm sure I screwed something up that she can <laughs> find uh, put in there next time. Lee Alexander okay. sent us some donut money, also without a note. We love notes. We yeah. will read your notes. Yeah. Let's make, Even if yeah. you can't type, like type with your nose or something, yeah. clearly yeah. you can click buttons. You Clearly you made it that far. <laughs> exactly. So we would love to be able to have a note from you yeah, that we can read. Yeah, we want to talk about you. And here's another one from Irene Briand. Oh. And she didn't leave a note either. Okay, well. I feel loved. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, yeah. I feel loved. Yeah. I just, you deserve to have your say. You do. You do. In, in, that said, if it's a 3,000 word essay, that's a whole other that's, podcast. Yeah, we're going to do some, uh, we're going to truncate that thing. Yes, we're we're not the best truncators. No, God left to our own devices, no. <laughs> let alone somebody else's devices. I can't get over how deep your voice is today. It's just glorious. It's glorious. I think I would like to permanently be sick. I don't want you to be permanently yeah. sick, my friend. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Dark I don't routine. feel good. It's the Dark Routine Hour. Thank you all for tuning in. Okay, yeah. Barry White. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Jazzercise. Hey, ladies. <laughs> These new mics help, too. Yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah, they, they definitely do. They make me sound more manly. Needs more than a mic to yeah. do that. Let less screechy. Thank you so much to our patrons, past and present, for your pledges. We really appreciate your support of the show, including you people who sent us that glorious donut money. Thank Woo-hoo. you so much. If you want to help support us, you can do so at patreon.com slash dark poutine, or for that one time support, you can send us some donut money via PayPal at our email address, dark poutine podcast at gmail.com. And if you don't already, it mean a lot to us. If you subscribe to the show, you can easily find us on iTunes Podcast, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, or wherever you get your on-demand audio. I'm finding Spotify is becoming a very big uh, hit for us. Oh, isn't it? Yes, okay. we're doing really well there. We're getting the Spotify feeds. Check out our website, darkpoutine.com, for show notes and other cool stuff. Hey, you know what? What's that? We haven't mentioned the Yumber Yard in a while. We haven't. So there's this Facebook group. Called yep. the Yumber Yard. Yep. And almost everybody there is really nice. Yep. Well, when you get thousands, there's going to be the odd yeah. uh, we, deal we have weed or over two. Over 6,000 now. So we've, we had to boot somebody, a few people last week yeah. for yeah. some really rude comments that they yeah. were making. Yeah. But we're there. We're, we're paying attention. Yeah. And we want to run a really nice community. And a lot of people, a lot of people enjoy the community. Just last night, I did like a shout out yeah. for places. Where is everybody Holy from? Holy Christ. Was it like a thousand comments? Over 1,100 comments. Holy shit. I've never had that much activity. I actually had to turn off my notifications for my Facebook. Oh my God, I bet. Because it was literally blown. Yeah. Oh my God, I yeah, bet. It's yeah. crazy. So come on, join us in the Yumber Yard. Just go to Facebook and type in Yumber Yard and you will find us. Yeah. Yumber. Dark Poutine Yard. Yumber Yard. Yep. It's as if somebody tried to say Lumber Yard, but screwed it up. Yeah. And that person did it in episode 12 and then Scott left it in. And look at what's come from that. Mm. Joy. Joy, I Pure guess. Pure joy. 
for everyone else except me. <laughs> yeah, that's what's important. <laughs> Please give us a like or a follow on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search for Dark Poutine. Most importantly, tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. Until next week, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye-bye, everybody. Good night. Mm, sweet dreams. Jazzercise. Sweet dreams. <laughs>